Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, yeah, Applied Physics, Institute of Applied Physics, and uh, I dare to talk about photochemistry. Um, so uh, what is it about nanoscale photochemistry? Actually, we would like to do chemistry on the nanoscopic spot. That's it. So I would like to do some chemistry exactly here. And this here, this nanospot is in the range of a couple of nanometers. So um, one kind of photochemistry is photopolymerization. It's just a very small branch of uh, big photochemistry, but photopolymerization works best now in our labs, and that's why I start with that. So uh, photopolymerization, so you shine light into a photoresist, and where you actually shine the light, the photoresist solidifies, and you create a structure. This is uh, the ordinary photopolymerization, which is routinely done, has a huge, huge impact in all the uh, electronics business. Intel makes all the chips with uh, photo patterning. The wafers, if you use two photons, these two array, uh, arrows going upwards in energy, so if you use two photons, then you actually can polymerize in three dimensions. If you ask me in the coffee break, I explain you why. So you can create three-dimensional uh, uh, um, samples, not only two-dimensional ones. And uh, on, the, on the upper right-hand side, you see a castle, and the castle is 300 times 300 times 300 microns in size. So this is micro-patterning, three-dimensional micro-patterning, using light, shining it, focusing it into the polymer, two-photon absorption. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side, the lower part is from our lab. This is a frog. Um, and the frog, uh, you see two things. Um, the size of the frog is 15 times 15 microns. Um, it has a hole, so uh, we didn't manage to make a nice frog, but I show you the frog with a hole because you see that it is hollow inside. So we have a real three-dimensional capability. We can make hollow structures. And uh, the second thing you see with this frog is these small pixels, okay? And uh, these pixels which you see here, <clears throat> these are longer than wider, and this is exactly your point spread function. When you focus light, you cannot focus light tighter than half of the wavelength approximately, and this is actually what you see here. So, and of course, if your pixel size has that dimension, which is approximately 200 nanometers, okay, then the structures, the minimal structure resolution you can get is on the order of half the wavelength. So this pixelation is a problem. Now, in lithography, we're using light going into the sample to do something. The reverse, something coming out, light coming out of the sample, this is well known, this is microscopy, okay? And microscopy has the same problem as lithography, it is diffraction limited. It was actually said to be diffraction limited, and please allow me to take a little step into history. So uh, the Carl Zeiss company, when Carl Zeiss himself was still alive, around 1870 in Jena, they knew that they did the very best. They had the best lenses in the world. They had the best machine shop in the world. And they recognized that the microscopes didn't get better anymore. So they experimentally, empirically recognized that there is a limit. But they could not explain that limit. So, um, in 1870, around, they actually went to Jena University to ask a physicist, a theoretical physicist, um, to, to help them. And this theoretical physicist actually did a lot of theory and mathematics, and I don't want to bother you with all that, but I bring you a very simple example, and this is a meter. And this is a meter that contains both. It contains millimeters and centimeters, and it contains inches. And this is very important because nature does not care whether we here in Austria are told by law that we have to use meter, and in Great Britain they are told by law that they have to use the inches. Nature doesn't care. So we need some natural meter, okay? And the natural meter in optics is the wavelength. Optics is a wave, light is a wave, so we have the wavelength. And when you have such a meter, when you have a meter with a millimeter scale, how good can you measure with a millimeter scale? I would say half a millimeter, okay? So you can say, this is on the tick, this is between, this is on the next tick. So when you have ticks on a millimeter scale, you can actually measure half the millimeter if you have good eyes. Okay, so wave is 
a wave is a cosine wave, I brought a cosine wave here, so when you have a cosine wave, half the ticks makes half the wavelength. Without any mathematics, you can understand that, okay? Um, but then uh, there was the problem uh, given to this theoretical physicist named Ernst Abbe, and you see the monument in front of Jena University, and uh, this monument contains a formula, and this is the so-called Abbe diffraction limit. Lambda is the wavelength, so the d, the distance, the closest distance you can actually resolve in a microscope, the closest distance is limited by the wavelength divided by 2 and some other numbers which are approximately 1, sine alpha is 1, the refractive index n is 1, so half the wavelength. That's it. This is, funny enough, this is a formula which you find on the monument, but this is the paper. This is the paper from 1873. It is a theoretical paper, 56 pages. I don't bother you with that, but it's very, very funny to read it, actually. And I have to read it out here because it's not on my screen here. Um, I switched to German because it was written in German, but it's funny. Uh, so, irgendeine bestimmte Farbe zugrunde gelegt ergibt der betreffende Minimalwert für rein zentrale Beleuchtung durch Division der Wellenlänge mit dem Sinus des halben Öffnungswinkels für den höchsten Grad äh, schiefer Beleuchtung nur halb so groß. And then there is also the refractive index. In. This is a formula. It was the style of the time not to write mathematical formulas. They spelled it out. 56 pages of theoretical physics, you don't find a single formula in it. This is the formula, okay? That's funny. Good. Okay, this was Ernst Appe. This was an industry project, okay? Because Carl Zeiss company asked him to find that out. This was in 1873, and since then a lot actually happened. Nevertheless, um, basically all the students, everybody learned that resolution is diffraction limited, right? I have learned that when I went to university. I have learned that resolution in microscopy is diffraction limited. That is surprising that we all learned that because in the 20s, in the 10th, right, 1910, 1920, there was a lot of new physics coming up and the new physics was quantum physics or quantum chemistry depending where you come from. Okay, and Niels Bohr in 1913, a chemist by, tra uh, by training, by the way, he actually calculated the hydrogen atom quantum mechanically, and in 1913 he published light absorption and emission by atoms. In 1927, Born and Oppenheimer actually extended his theory to molecules, to organic molecules, and published how organic molecules absorb and emit light. Uh, no talk from a physicist without quoting Albert Einstein. So in 1916, he postulated stimulated emission, which was experimentally verified by Rudolf Ladenburg in 1928. That's a while ago. And that's all you need, actually, to show that the diffraction does not limit resolution, despite that fact, up to, actually, up to today, People are learning that diffraction limits resolution. Not true anymore. And that this is not true actually was found out by Stefan Hell, uh, who gave a talk here four months ago. And his proposal was the following. So you take the best objective lens you can get, you focus light, and that gives you this cigar, okay, this green spot. And all the molecules are excited inside the cigar. When you have a molecule sitting to the right and one to the left, both of them are excited. You don't know which of these two are, uh, which of these two emit the photon. You cannot resolve them. And he had the idea, well, I excite all these molecules, but if I could switch off to the left, to the right, in front and behind the focal plane, if I could switch off the molecules immediately after I've excited, then only in a very small spot the molecules remain in the excited state. There is energy still in these molecules, and then they fluoresce, and then you have the pre-knowledge that this fluorescence must come from this small spot. Okay? Very nice idea. And then stimulated emission is the natural counterplayer of fluorescence, so you can use stimulated emission to switch off fluorescence. That was the idea that in 1994 was postulated by Stefan Hell, and he uh, earned the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, by the way, in 2014. The Nobel Committee for Chemistry argued it's quantum chemistry, so we give him 
the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, although he is a physicist by training. So you see, it, it switches easily between physics and chemistry. This is the experimental result. Very early in 2000, we had a, a three-dimensional resolution of 100 nanometers, which is below the diffraction limit. That proved the physics. Meanwhile, the Hell group is down to a single nanometer if they do a record measurement. I don't want to talk about microscopy, actually, but uh, now I have to switch. But before I switch, um, ju just to give, it, uh, give you the timetable again. So in 1873, there was a, gay, uh, there was, there was a guy uh, named Ernst Abbe, and he postulated there is a diffraction limit, and everybody learned it. And then in uh, latest, in 1928, all the modern physics, what we call modern physics, was known actually to prove this Abbe wrong, but still everybody believed it. Why? Because uh, if uh, a big enough number of people tells you that this is true, everybody believes it's true. So the message, the, the message, the take-home message, if you don't understand anything from physics, the take-home message is don't believe your professors. Um, okay, nanoscopy. So now we have to come back to photochemistry. Um, in STAD nanoscopy, stimulated emission depletion, that's the technique, that's the acronym, uh, you excite a molecule. So the electron gains energy from the photon and then the electron drops down and emits green fluorescence and if you put red stimulated emission light in you can stop the fluorophore from emitting green light that's it okay so switching um, and now can we transfer that to improve the resolution in photochemistry and we can do that because in photochemistry you have a molecule the molecule absorbs the light and now the excited electron is not using its excitation energy to fluoresce but it is it uses the excitation energy to kick on a reaction okay and if we bring down the electron down again we if we, we, we squeeze down the molecule faster then actually the reaction occurs, then we can quench the chemical reaction in the outer spot. And I remember you, the frog, at the very beginning, we had these voxels, these volume elements, and when we make them smaller, we can make sharper frogs. Okay, that's it. That's the whole idea, um, and this whole idea is actually was postulated in 1999, so when you write a stat paper in microscopy, of course you know that uh, you can do that in lithography, so there was the proposal, that was the last line of the paper, so we can also, it should be possible to use the stat concept for three-dimensional photochemistry. Okay. Um, and it works. So we can do 3D uh, nanolithography, and this is from our lab. This, the door frame, this is a freestanding uh, free door frame, so we make a frame, a very thick, uh, thick frame, just with two photon microscopy. And then we write these horizontal rungs uh, with increasing power in the depletion beam, and that makes these rungs smaller and smaller and smaller. And the smallest one on top, we have 53 nanometers, written with visible light. This is a tenth of the wavelength, not half of the wavelength. Okay, so we can use that for stat lithography. A few applications. Um, we, are, we, we have been collaborating with the Blutzentrale here in Upper Austria, um, where we had these flow channels. So we have a flow channel here for blood, and the Blutzentrale is interested in blood clothing. Um, if you don't have enough, uh, you have this uh, bleeder illness. If you have too much, you get a stroke. Um, so they're interested in that, and uh, here the blood flows, and, and we wrote these obstacles in, in, into the way, actually, to make, um, to make seeds where the blood could uh, make uh, cloths, and, and, and they are using that um, to, to do their um, investigations. Or another example, we had this uh, also in a, in a flow cell, so we make molecular fishing. We fish out uh, these molecules, um, and make an Im immunoassay. Okay, but now that was all lithography, stat lithography, but lithography is just a very small part of more general photochemistry, okay? And uh, what we did also right now, so we wrote our three-dimensional structures, and uh, then we used electrostatic attachment afterwards. We also used a little bit more sophisticated chemistry. We used thiol chemistry to attach fluorophores or proteins to our structures. We used peptide bonds, we used oxidation steps, etc. But the real holy grail would be, the generally would be to use directly stimulated emission switching for photochemistry. That's what we are after in our lit project. And uh, I show you now a very first result, which we have. We have a substrate 
and uh, now we have uh, organic molecules that actually bleach, which means they oxidize, and when they oxidize, they are reactive. So we illuminate them with this STAT technique, and then we have just a, a small number, not a single one less here, but a small number of molecules to the spot. It carries a little biotin, and uh, the bio uh, people among you, they know that with streptovidine we can add another fluorophore. The other fluorophore is our readout that we actually have this uh, functional group. And this is brand new data, first published actually at the Linz Winter Workshop, end of January. You are the second audience who see uh, this, and uh, you see that it works. The full width half maximum is decreasing when we actually apply our technique. Um, that is the group behind it. Um, so we have, of course, uh, people from two, coming from two disciplines, physicists and chemists from five countries, uh, gender balanced, by the way. And um, I leave it up to you to figure out who of these faces belongs to physicists or chemists or who's coming from which country. Um, collaborations are with Ian Teasdale from the um, um, polymer chemistry department, Günter Knör from the uh, photophysics uh, chemistry, Peter Hinterdorfer from biophysics, Thomas Grieser from the polymer chemistry group in Leoben, and uh, last but not least, my former postdoc, now professor at the Fachhochschule downtown Linz at Medical Technology, Jaroslav Jacek, and I thank you for your attention.